you know, internal journey. But so what I advise for people out there, so um, Rich, do we, can I do a quick exercise? For yes, go right ahead, by all means. Awesome. Okay. So if you're out there listening, this, the feeling of freedom is actually something that you can feel in your body. Um, our bodies are like natural truth tellers where our mind, you know, any good neuroscientist will tell you our minds, our left brain especially are like spin doctors and it, our brains are amazing. They, they work with very limited information to help create, you know, safety and comfort and um, but the, the problem is that our minds, you know, you can convince yourself of lots of different things, whether or not it's actually in alignment with what's your right life or what's best for you. So your body is like the incorruptible truth teller. It's kind of like a polygraph test. It works for a reason because when most people speak an untruth, unless you're a sociopath or a psychopath, there's an immediate and automatic physical response in the body when you speak an untruth. And, and when I say speak an untruth, um, I also would lump in there living a life that's not true for you. Your body is going to react. So just if you're out there listening, um, if you're seated or laying somewhere comfortably, I just want you to think for a moment about a negative memory, something that was pretty painful for you. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be the most traumatic thing that's ever happened, but something that was pretty unpleasant. And I just want you to notice as you're – close your eyes, step back into this, hold it like an object or like play it like a movie in your mind's eye. And what sensations are happening in your body? And just go from your toes all the way up through your body cavity, your gut and your heart, all the way up to your head. And so I will just say, use myself as an example, the memory that I go to for this exercise is a particular fight I had with my ex-husband. We were hosting a party in our home and um, things got escalated, and it was very embarrassing for me. And so when I go back to that memory, I feel a tightness in my heart and chest area, and my throat closes up, um, making it kind of hard to breathe or talk. So just notice have, for yourself. Yeah. I have a – I just, I just uh, tried that exercise and, and went back to an old traumatic memory, and I had the, I had the distinct feeling of a – tremendous weight on my shoulders yes that's and that what you just described usually when people return to one of these negative memories there while everyone's body speaks to them differently there are common threads when we are having when we're experiencing a negative memory so heaviness what you just described spot on um, usually there's a constriction somewhere in the body tightness in your gut or your heart um, some people get a little dissociated, so their head may feel a little bit dizzy. Again, I didn't, the, the, I didn't let it go on that long. Yeah, well, good. And we don't need to stay there too long. I just want to experience for those out there, what does it feel like holding this negative memory? Okay, so let's let that negative memory go. If you need to shake out your arms, you know, roll your neck, stretch a little bit. But come back to your baseline. And this time, I want you to do the same thing, but with a positive memory. Um, so, you know, it can be a moment in time or a period of time, spending time with your companion animal or your kiddos. It could be your hobby that you love, a spot in nature. But, yeah, just something positive, a positive memory. Um, I go to being with my dog um, who has since passed away, but my memories with him always take me to this beautiful place. So just notice as you hold this positive memory what is happening in your body. And just, you know, playing it like a movie in your mind's eye, step right back into it, and what happens? And just go start with your toes, freedom. go all the way. Yeah, yes. Okay, where do you feel the freedom, if you had to label it? Around my, around my chest area. Love it. Okay, see, that's perfect. That's it. And, and again, the, it sounds like I, like I planted this collar because this is so perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I did not. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Oh, I said it sounds like I planted you as a caller because you're having the exact – I mean, this is how this exercise works, but it's, it's just landing perfectly. Each is the perfect subject. Isn't that great? Oh, it is. Yes. Thank you so much uh, for calling in because this is perfect. So, again, each person's body is going to speak to them differently. But common threads when you're holding this positive memory are feelings of freedom, expansion, relief, lightness. 
And so we'll call, you know, when you have that negative feeling, the heaviness or the contraction, that's a shackles on response, like wearing prison shackles. That freedom, that release, that expansion, we'll call that shackles off. So here's the thing that you can do is if you're thinking of your relationship, does your relationship, when you envision being with this person that you're spending day in and day out with, does it feel shackles on or shackles off? And for me, and you can actually, just as a side note, you can use this tool on people, on places, on things. So like envision being in your job. Is your job or the work that you do, is it shackles on or shackles off? Or let's say um, the person that you spend the most time with, like not romantically, but let's just say a colleague or a family member, when you envision being with this person, is it shackles on or shackles off? It's easy and to I, remember. Yeah, okay. Well, tell me, share me. What were you thinking of when that came up? I'm sorry? Oh, what, when you said that's easy to remember, do you mind sharing what, what, what was easy or what felt? You talked a little about the Waze emotions, W-A-Z-E emotions, <laughs> situational depression, and the ingenious stop sign of the soul. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of the people that, that I work with, and I was like this before, um, emotions are something to be avoided or suppressed because they can be scary and uncomfortable, um, especially emotions that perhaps culturally we've deemed not positive, you know, rage or anger, um, um, grief, those kind of things. We tend to just want to just gloss right over them. And what I would suggest, and a lot there are a lot of other awesome people out there who have been doing research on this for a long time, is that our emotions are actually like a guidance system. So I, I don't know about you all, but I, I have the app um, on my phone, Waze, W-A-Z-E, and it's this awesome, like, shared traffic app where you, other people are, uh, as they're driving, are saying, oh, there's a policeman here, and there's a, there's a roadblock here, and this route is faster, and it just basically helps you get around in a much more efficient um, and, and uh, wonderful, easeful way. And so what I talk about in the book is that our emotions are like ways for our life. They are mm-hmm. the things that will tell us whether we're on the right track or not. So instead of suppressing them or trying to make them go away or avoid them, if you embrace them and learn how to do so in a healthy way, and there are a lot of tips and tricks and tools out there for doing that, and it just you know really depends on what resonates for you, But they can tell you whether you're headed, just like following the freedom, they can tell you whether you're heading in the direction of your right life. And so what you mentioned, the situational depression and the ingenious stop sign of the soul, I can't take credit for that. This is actually from the work of, of Carla McLaren. And she is, I think, one of the foremost experts out there on emotions. She has two incredible books out there, one of which is called The Language of Emotions. And she distinguishes between situational depression, and clinical depression. And situational depression would be the kind of depression that would come about when you have a, something that comes up in your life, like, for example, divorce would be a big one, that causes a certain amount of um, sadness and grief. And you can kind of get stuck there for a little while, whereas she defines, you know, the clinical depression as needing more the medical intervention or you've already kind of got the the grooves worn in your brain. Um, And there are various schools of thought on depression. So I'm just, this is just based on Carla McLaren's work. But she basically says that when you're in a, a situational depression situation, whether it's from related to a job or a family situation or a divorce, that it's the ingenious stop sign of the soul because it invites you instead of, um, and I, again, when I say this, I have no judgment about medication or how people like to treat depression, but instead of just running out and trying to put a Band-Aid over the depression and make it go away, exploring it for what it's telling you about what's going on in your life. So is there something that needs to be addressed? Is there a job that you need to move away from because it's causing you so much fight or flight reaction or stress response or sadness? Is there a relationship or your divorce that is creating this situation? Is there something that just kind of puts the stop sign on and says, hey, what's going on in your life that needs to be looked at? And instead of glossing over it or suppressing it, 
actually inviting it to be a catalyst for something that needs to change. It's hard you to talk say. about. You talk about self love in chapter seven, Sunny Joy. Tell us how uh, self love and self compassion fit into all of this. Well, so um, I, as I mentioned before, I was raised um, in a pretty conservative community, and there was a message that I think that, us, and I would say, women hear this or perhaps internalize this even more than than men. And I hate to generalize, but I feel like we're told from a very young age that always put other people before yourself, that it is pleasing in God's eyes, or this is how it was presented to me, you know, it's pleasing in God's eyes to always put other people first, other people first. And what ends up happening, at least for me, was that by the time I had adulthood, all I had done was live for other people, to serve other people, to please other people, not disappoint other people. And I had no... Um, self-care, self-love, self-compassion routine. I had a very critical inner voice. I didn't think that I was worthy of, of appreciating myself. And I just became completely depleted. And really, if I'm being honest, very resentful. And because I'm constantly giving and giving, but there's nothing replenishing me. And I just... I fell in love with the work of Anita Morjani, and I don't know for your listeners, Rich, if anybody out there has read either of her books, but the one that really resonated for me was this book called Dying to Be Me. And have you have you read that? I have not yet read that. Tell us more a little about that. I never yeah. heard of her. What, would you repeat her name? Yes, yeah, sure. Her name is Anita, and her last name is Morjani, and it's uh, M O O R. J N I. So she has, I think, the most powerful near death experience story out there today. Um, she had stage four, or actually in stage lymphoma, with these huge weeping lesions on her body. Um, she was like 85 pounds. Her organs were shutting down. She couldn't um, process all the toxins. And she, the family was called in, she goes into a coma, and they think she's going to die. All the doctors have said this, and this has been a very long battle that she's had with this cancer. And instead, she has this most powerful near-death experience where she meets her father, who had transitioned several years before, and some other lost loved ones. And basically, the way that she describes it was, she remembered who she really was as this beautiful worthy, magnificent spiritual being. And her dad told her, Anita, if you decide to come back from this near-death experience, go back and live your life fearlessly, and you will have the power to do anything that you want to do because you've remembered, you had a taste of who you really are now here on the other side. And she came out of the coma, and she, within four days, the tumors had decreased by about 70% in size. And within about five weeks, she left the hospital completely cancer-free. And she's been on numerous talk shows, Dr. Oz and others. She's had doctors review the medical records from this hospital in Hong Kong where she was being treated. And it's, I mean, man, it was for real. And the thing that she credits her recovery to and her life today and everything that she's done is self-love. Self-love was the most important thing in her recovery And lack of self-love was the most important factor in creating the cancer in her body, as as she describes it. And her book, man, it just got me, it brought the concept of self-love, which always used to seem really fluffy and selfish and meaningless. I, I mean, I mean, I run in coaching and spirituality circles, and I still couldn't quite get there. But the way that she described it was, if you ever hear that golden rule, you know, love your neighbor as thyself, if you don't love yourself first, you can't love your neighbor as thyself. You've got to love yourself in a big way if you can love your neighbor in a big way, if that makes sense. And the way that you put it, man, it just hit home for me. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Do you have any any advice on it's a person that has was not loved in childhood, that did not have the self-esteem instilled into them, how they can learn to love themselves? That is such a good question. Um, so the the two things that I would recommend, number one, 
Um, and this is based on the research of Dr. Kristen Neff. She's at the University of Texas in Austin. She has a book called Self-Compassion. The number one thing that I have found that has become vital in my own self-love journey is noticing the voice, your inner voice. So for people and clients of mine who have been raised similarly who don't have the loving background to return to, learning to develop the voice of the wise, loving adult internally. So when things, let's say you make a mistake at work, instead of having an inner voice that says, you idiot, you should have done better, what the hell were you thinking? Noticing your inner voice and having a soothing, loving inner voice that says, oh, you know what, being human is hard sometimes. We make mistakes. Uh, it's okay, and you're doing the best that you can. And there is very good research out there now to show the physical and emotional effects in the body of having a kind inner voice. So number one, having a kind inner voice that constantly is encouraging you, self-validating, uh, and it may feel really freaking awkward in the beginning. It did for me. But sticking with it with that persistent, consistent effort can make a big difference in rewiring your brain and having beautiful hormonal chemical effects in the body, the exact opposite of having an, a, a very critical inner voice. And the second it's thing becoming, that I would rec Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's becoming your own uh, loving parent. Yes. Okay, what you just said it, you summed it up in one sentence, but it took me, <laughs> like, that was beautifully put. <laughs> Beautifully put. Um, and the second thing is, um, uh, this is based on the work of Louise Hay. Um, and again, this felt so awkward to me in the beginning. But mirror work, man, it's effective. And mirror work just basically means looking in the mirror, either every time you pass by a mirror, actually setting some time aside where you actually look yourself in the eye in the mirror and tell yourself, for me, you know, Sunny, I love you. Sunny, you're doing great work. Sunny, you're doing the best you can. And just looking eye to eye with the spiritual being that's in there, that's in all of us, and recognizing that magnificence, that worthiness, and saying it out loud, verbalizing it. And I tell you, that stuff is powerful. As awkward and crazy as it sounded to me in the beginning, Oh, you, it you works. Feel that people are basically good or basically bad. I would say basically good. And Rich, I know we're getting toward the end of the hour, so I don't want to jump in too much. But I, to the caller, I, I very, very strongly believe we come in as born worthy, magnificent, beautiful spiritual creatures, and it's all just the garbage that's piled on top along the way that keeps us from it. Well, Sunny Joy, as as we come to the end of the hour, I would like for you to tell everyone uh, where people can find out more about you. Tell us where we can find your book. Tell us about your websites and everything you have going on. Yes, thank you. And I will say the number one thing I love doing is giving away free books. If you would like my book, Unhitched, Unlock Your Courage and Clarity and Unstick Your Bad Marriage, I would love to gift a copy to anyone out there. My email address is sunnyjoy at goldenoversoul.com. That's sunnyjoy at goldenoversoul.com. And I will gladly gift you a book. And my website is goldenoversoul.com if you want to find out more about me. Golden what? Uh, Oversoul. It's spelled, it's uh, one word, O-V-E-R-S-O-U-L. Oversoul. GoldenOversoul.com. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, everyone, this has been Sonny Joy McMillan, the author of Unhitched, Unstick Your Bad Marriage. Sonny Joy, I really want to thank you for being my guest tonight. And uh, this will become some YouTube videos, which you uh, will be free, of course, to share around to help promote your book. And they'll be available on YouTube possibly as early as tomorrow. And uh, it will be redacted from, from this show. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rich. This has been such a pleasure. And thank you so much to that awesome caller who kept the conversation with all kinds of fun uh, input and questions. Thank you. You're welcome, Sonny. And I'd like to have you back as a guest in the future as well. Oh, okay.